to you. Now, I, I'm assuming you've already done the warm-up, and if you haven't done those first three warm-up problems, uh, would you please go ahead and do those, pause the video, and then we'll, we'll start over or start back here when we get those done. Uh, when you have those done, you get the video turned back on. So here we are, uh, the square root of 18. Now this is just simple review. What we're looking for here is, when you have that square root of 18, we're looking for those perfect squares. We're gonna factor those perfect squares out of 18. So we have the square root of now, the product of nine and two, and we all should know that the square root of nine is three, so we get three root two. All right, now, the cube root of 16. We have to shift gears. Now we're looking for perfect cubes. So in this case, the cube root of 16 can be factored as the factor of cube root of eight times two, excuse me, where the eight being the perfect cube, you end up with two cube root of two. And then finally, in the real number plane, we cannot take the square root of negative four. So we could say, if we're talking about strictly real numbers here, that this has no solutions, that it's not possible. Now, you, we all know that uh, we've talked about the fact that uh, that would be factored as negative one times four, and the square root of negative one would give you that complex unit i, and the square root of four is two, so you could say two times the complex unit i. Um, that's fine, but for, for, for the means of what we're talking about today, if we're not gonna be taking the square root of any negatives. Now, I'm gonna go about this a little differently than if I were there. Uh, if I were there, I'd do this, these notes a little differently, but since I'm not, we're gonna skip ahead, so would you please go through your notes. Now, listen, anything that I'm skipping through, I have worked out and posted online, so you're welcome to check those out. But what I want you to do is jump to the page in your notes where you have these first four problems. The first one being the square root of 16x to the sixth. Then you have uh, number two is the negative square root of 8v cubed. Number three is the square root of d cubed f to the fourth. And number four here is the square root of h to the fourth j to the sixth. And if you would, Get those problems, make an attempt on each of those, and then I'm gonna come back. You can stop the video right now, try those four problems, and then I want you to turn the video back on. And I'm gonna go over, and there's gonna be some things in here, that have some wrinkles that I assume, unless you're looking into the book and you're ahead, that you're gonna make some mistakes. So go ahead, factor these, pull everything out of the radical that you can, and then turn the video back on. So give it a shot. All right. Now, I'm hoping you already have some solutions here. So when you're looking at 16x to the 6th, you're thinking to yourself, well, I know the square root of 16 is 4. And I, I know that if I have x to the 6th in there, that that means for every pair of x's that I can take out of there, I mean, one way to look at that, I'm not saying you have to write this, is that we could think of that as 16 times x squared times x squared times x squared. And for every pair of x's that we have on the inside, pair of factors x, we can pull one out. So technically, I'm assuming a lot of you wrote this as 4x cubed. And that is wrong. And, but let me explain why. We are saying right now, by the way we've written this, that these two values, these two expressions, the, 16, the square root of 16x to the 6 and 4x cubed are equivalent. And they have the exact same domain or the exact same set of possible outcomes. Well, we cannot assume that x can be negative. And why am I saying that? Well, if I put a negative x into the original problem, I would be taking that x to a power of 6. If you want something simple, put negative 1 in for x. I would have the square root of 16 times x, I'm sorry, negative 1 to a power of 6. And that negative 1 to a power of 6 would then be turned into a positive 1 because it would be taken to the even power of 6. Now check this out. Would that get the same exact outcome in what I said this, this expression simplifies to? Put a negative 1 in here. Am I going to get a nice positive outcome? No, I'm going to get a negative outcome. So one simple example, substituting a negative value in here will not make this true. So what I have to keep in mind is any time I take the square root of a value, and I end up with an odd, now again, this only applies to even indexed problems, so like square roots and fourth roots. If I take the square root and I end up with an odd number, as far as my exponent goes, I have to take into consideration that I must put some absolute values on here. So I'm going to rewrite this. Instead of 4x cubed, I must 
write this as 4x squared, because guess what? If I square something, even if it's negative, it becomes a positive. But that last and final x needs to have an absolute value sign on it. And you like, may be thinking to yourself right now, uh, holy moly, that's complex. Uh, well, let's try a few more, and I, maybe it'll help you out there a little bit. All right, let's take a look at this number two here, the negative, um, pardon me, square root of 8v cubed. So let's factor that. We have a negative, and then what's going on inside that square root? We have 8, we can break that apart and make that 4 times 2, and then the v cubed, that becomes a v squared and a v. Now, what can come out? Well, we know we have the negative sign is already outside there, so let's leave that outside. The square root of 4 is going to become a 2. Now, that can't change signs. It's a constant. It's a 2. But let's think about that. We have a v squared inside here. Now, that v squared, if I put in a negative 1 for v, let's just, I'm going to keep using negative 1 because it's an easy value. If I put a negative 1 in here for v squared, this would become a positive 1. But when I factor that out, those two v's, when I factor them out of the square root, become a single v. Now, can I put a negative 1 in for this v? It's going to stay negative, and I can't accept that. I can't allow that, because in here, it would have been made into a positive. So I have to put absolute value symbols on there. And then the, the values that say inside the square root, in this case, are the 2 and that other v. So let's think about that one more time. When I have an even index, so this is a square root, and I have this even power inside there, that when that comes out of here becomes an odd. Are you with me? It was a power 2, but when I pull those out of there, I come out with an odd number of v's. Then I have to put those absolute value signs to make sure that when I substitute a negative in here, that negative would then, those absolute values would then convert that into a positive. Uh, let's move on down here. The cube, I'm sorry, the square root of d cubed f to the fourth. Let's think about that. That's the square root of d cubed is the same as d squared times d times f to the fourth power. Now, take a look at this. I have two d's inside there, right here, and then I have one more, the d squared and the d. This d squared, there's enough to pull one out. But remember, if I take out that single d, I have to put an absolute value on it, times what's going to happen to that the single d that's still inside there? It says square root of d. Now, what's going to happen to this f to the fourth? Well, since I have four f's on the inside of that square root, I'm able to pull two of those out. Those four would then become f squared times f squared. All right, so I get an f squared out. And notice, I don't have to put absolute values on here because it's an f squared. I'm pulling out, I end up with an even number of f's there. So if I were to put in a negative value for f, when I square it, it would make it positive, so I don't have to worry about it. Now, take a look at here. I can't, I usually would rewrite this with the absolute value first, so I put that d in there times the f squared, and I usually just make a habit of putting the radical last. If you put the f squared in front of the absolute value, I wouldn't worry about it either way. Now finally, h to the fourth, j to the sixth. Remember, I'm going to pull out that h to the fourth, and that's going to become h squared. All right, because that's the same as h squared times h squared, so I can factor that out. That's no problem. I don't need absolute values on that. But what about that j to the sixth? That's three j's. That's a j cubed, right? I need absolute value symbols on there. Now, to be honest with you, we don't need uh, to put all three of the j's inside there. So what we normally would do is we'd call it eight square, h squared times j squared, and then just put the, uh, the last j in absolute values. I know this can be confusing. It is a little bit stressful. Let's go ahead and let's tackle at least one or two more of these. All right, we'll walk through them together. So you have here number five, the square root. And I'm going to make this a little bit bigger. All right, forgive me. The square root of 25a squared b to the 8th c to the 10th. Okay, now look up there. Right now, we obviously know the square root of 25. That's not going to be difficult. But look at these a's, b's, and c's. And when I pair those together and factor them out of this square root, which ones am I going to have an odd number of them? Think about that. 
I have a squared. What's going to happen when I take those two a's and I can pull out then a single a, a single one a, then I'm going to need some absolute value symbols. How about the b's? I have eight b's. When I pair those up and, and then pull them outside of that radical, I'm going to have four of them. That's an even number of b's that I'm pulling out of there, so I won't need the absolute values. And then finally, c to the tenth. I have ten of those c's, but I pair them up and that allows me to pull out five of those c's and therefore I'll need those absolute values in there somewhere. So let's write this. The square root of 25 is 5. A squared. I only pull out a single A, so I must put absolute values on there. B to the 8th, I pull out four of them, so I have B to the 4th, and since it's the even number, I do not need absolute value symbols. And C to the 10th. Now, I'm going to write C to the 5th, and I'm going to put them all inside absolute values. But I want you to remember that it's okay if I, if I wanted to pull, if I have an odd number, you could leave them in there just like that, or you could pull out four of those and leave only one inside. For the most part, to keep it simple, I'm okay if you just write it as 5b to the fourth, since those are the two things that were not inside absolute values, and then you only write one set of absolute values, and you put the a and the c to the fifth on the inside, that's fine by me. If you were to look on your, in your book, you might see that they take C to the fourth out of there and only left one C in. Uh, that's fine. I'm going to accept this and find it dandy. I'm not, not going to split hairs on it. But understand, the odd variables, the variables with odd exponents, I should say, are the ones that must be inside the absolute value when you're done, whereas the even exponents don't need to. All right? And where is this all coming from? It all stems from the fact that this was an even index to begin with. If these were cube roots, we wouldn't even need to worry about. You'll never, if you have an odd index, need to even worry about absolute values in your simplified form. How about number six? You have a fourth root. A fourth root. So that's an even index. So guess what? If I end up with an odd exponent, I have to put absolute value symbols on it. So I ask myself, all right, 81. That's the same as, so the fourth root of 81, as the, and that 81 is the same as 3 to the fourth times x to the fifth, times y to the twelfth. That means for every four group of four factors on the inside, I can factor one out. So I am going to be able to take out a three. And you might say, well, that's an odd number of threes. Do you have to put absolute values around it? No. And the reason meaning is because three is a constant. It's not going to change its sign and become a negative. So I don't need to worry about absolute values on there. Now, if I take four of those x's, I can factor out a single x. That's a single x, only one of them, so that's an odd number, so I must put an absolute value on that x. By the way, one's going to still be in there, so we can't forget that. And maybe it'd be helpful if you go ahead and you write your fourth root, and you left one of those x's on the inside. Notice I, only, I used four of them to be able to factor this single x out, but one stayed in. This represents four of those roots that were in the inside. This represents one. And finally, y to the twelfth. Now, if I, if I group those 12 y's into groups of four, how many subgroups of four am I going to have? Three of them. So that's an odd number. So I'd have to put y cubed right here. Yeah. Now, since these are both in absolute values, I could put them inside the same absolute value. So I'd have three times the absolute value of x y cubed times the fourth root of x. All right. Now I'm not. I'm going to jump jump down to this very next problem here. And you have the cube root of x quantity x plus three to the ninth. And I need you to understand. As soon as you see a cube root, you're never going to have to draw an absolute value symbol on any of these outcomes. So boom, I know that number seven is going to be a walk in the park. All I have to remember is if I have nine of these x plus threes on the inside of there and I break them into groups of three, because that's the index, that tells me how many groups I'm dealing with. If I, I, for every group of three x plus threes I have, I can pull one out. So that means I'm going to be able to take out three groups of those x plus threes. That's all we're going to get. Now number eight, do I have an even index? Yes. So I must keep those absolute value symbols in mind. And if I have an odd number of something, in this case, it's saying, what's the square root of x plus 3 squared? So how many of those quantity x plus 3s do I have in there? Two of them. And that means I can factor one out 
I'll say that one more time. I can factor one out, so I better put that one inside absolute values. Now, technically, you wouldn't need those parentheses in there. I just left them in there so you'd think of it as that quantity. 